Hey friends, it's me, Rosie, and I'm here to just say hey, hi, hello, and introduce this next video. It's a little bit different than what I've been doing because I wanna to talk to you a little bit about resin art. This is a new art style for me, but I've been doing it almost every day for a month, which I feel like has given me a lot of really cool experience, and I've been learning so much on the job every single day. I've been able to fill commissions to make wall art as well as home goods for people. I think I'll always keep those commissions open because I truly am enjoying making resin art. So I wanted to talk a little bit about it, tell you what I've been experiencing, and I wanna show you a couple of the projects that I've been making. So I hope you enjoy. All right, let's kick off our resin art video by talking materials. When working with resin, you'll notice that a lot of your materials are made of silicone. These mats on my table, for example, are silicone. And that's because silicone is one of the few materials that resin doesn't bond to. If you spill a little resin on these mats, you can simply peel it off later when it's dry. And since resin can be a little messy, I highly recommend some mats on your table. To make epoxy resin for your art, you're going to be mixing equal parts of two different solutions together, the actual resin and a hardening agent. And once these two are thoroughly mixed, the clock starts on your project because resin art only has about 40 minutes of active work time before hardening. Next up are molds, and mine are of course made of silicone. If you wanna make 3D products, you're going to need to use molds. As you can see, I have a couple different types of resin projects off to the side here. You can encase a lot of things in resin if you're careful with it. But if you don't take care of your molds, they're going to rip and degrade on you pretty quickly. I also have these silicone pour cups to measure and mix large amounts of resin. And I love that they are reusable. You can peel the resin out of it when it's all dried. I also have these plastic cups that I use to measure smaller amounts or mix small amounts of color in with these popsicle sticks as my stirring sticks. I like the plastic cups a lot, and when the resin dries, you can reuse the cup to some extent. It won't be as accurate with measuring though. And I recommend buying these mixing materials in bulk if you can. These are what go the fastest for me. Gloves are also a super big necessity when working with resin. It is not safe for resin to touch your bare skin. I can't stress it enough, wear gloves when you cast resin. Let's move on to pigment. I have some jars of pigment that I like, and I have a lot of baggies of pigment. And I personally prefer powder pigment. The colors are really bright, and they're made with mica powder a lot of the time, so there's some shine to them that I really love. I also have a box of liquid resin dyes, and these are really cool if you want swirling effects dropped into clear resin. However, when they're mixed into resin, the color turns quite transparent compared to a powder pigment. It's still really very beautiful, and it reminds me almost of watercolor paints. But for starters, I think that powder pigment might be a little easier to work with. It may also be helpful to have some easy to clean tools when working with resin. These are some clay carving tools that I like to use sometimes. I also use a heat gun, which is useful to get bubbles out of your resin, but can also help achieve some really cool resin art effects like cells and webbing. Most importantly though, is my respirator mask. Resin fumes are very dangerous to breathe in for an extended amount of time. So you need a heavy duty mask if you're not working in a well ventilated space. I keep the windows of my workroom open with fans that blast all the air out when I do pours. And I still wear this mask at all times because protective equipment like this is an absolute must if you wanna work with resin. So please stay safe and protected if you wanna try this art out. That being said, I think we're ready to see a project where I do some coaster pours. So first I wanna make sure that I have my protective equipment on, my gloves. Ideally, I would be wearing long sleeves as well, but this video was taken on a warmer day and I was wearing short sleeves. So there's no excuse. Anyways, I'm going to be pouring equal amounts of both the resin and the hardener in this silicone pour cup. 
and I want to make sure that these are equal parts because if not it's not going to cure properly and I'm going to have some weird soft spots. So you want to measure as carefully as you possibly can and luckily the pour cups have notches on them where you can see the exact amounts and they're pretty accurate. I tested them with water before I did resin just to see if there was any discrepancy in the measurements. Measuring your resin with accuracy is really important. If you don't get this right, it's going to be wrong the whole project. This next step is also super important, and that's mixing your hardener and resin together. I mix it so thoroughly, probably a minute and a half to two minutes uninterrupted mixing. And that's because I have learned this lesson the hard way. If you don't mix this properly, it's not going to cure properly, and you're going to have soft and squishy parts in your product. And that means you're probably gonna have to throw that product out. So take it from me, someone who has thrown out a lot of her resin product now, mix well. Another lesson that I've learned is that if you want to encase an object in resin, you should pour in layers. Resin tends to float an object up to its surface in a mold. So you may have a hard time keeping your item in place. I like to pour a little resin into the mold and then push my item into the top of it and let that set completely before I pour any more layers. And that's going to keep it anchored in the middle of your object. This L coaster is going to be a prime example of what happens if you don't let that first layer cure long enough before adding the next. I wanted you to see this mistake because I think we can all learn a little lesson from it. In my defense, this was an earlier project and I have learned a lot since then, luckily. Next, I'm gonna start mixing up the resin that I'm gonna be using for these coasters. These are a commission that I did for a friend of mine who wanted to gift his wife with something that represented each member of the family. So each of these letters are the first letter of one of the family member's names. And I am mimicking the colors of the letters with the colors of the resin. And for all of these cups of resin, I only added about a spoonful of the powdered pigment with this little measuring spoon. However, off camera, I do add more red pigment to this container because it does have a little more resin than the cups do. But I don't have that shown here, so you're just gonna have to take my word for it. But I think we can all agree that that red could be more red. When working with molds, I try to mix my powder in as thoroughly as I possibly can. When I work on a canvas for wall art, the resin can spread, it can drip over the sides, and pockets of powder that weren't mixed in well can pop up and create really interesting effects on the canvas. I like that. But those powder pockets would just sit in the resin mold, and it can keep it from curing properly. Molds can be pretty temperamental and I've lost enough work now that I don't want to chance anything when I fill the mold. Which is why this L coaster is such a lesson in this project video. Because you're going to see how it reacts differently when you don't do everything correctly versus when you do with the other three. As I'm adding in the blue resin here, look at the bottom right of the L coaster that you see you can see that that blue is starting to interact with the clear resin that's still in its workable stage underneath it. I had started the other three coasters the day before, so that resin was nice and hard. And that meant that the letters also wouldn't float around, they'd stay right in place in between the two layers, the clear and the color layer of resin that I've poured. However, the L coaster had only been made about a half hour before I got to the stage that you're seeing on camera here. And that means that that clear bottom layer of resin is still in the 40 minute work time. And as I add more resin on top, it is sinking into that clear layer and interacting with it in a way that you're not seeing in the other three coasters. Since that bottom layer is hard, the resin's sitting on top of it and it's only interacting with the other colored resin that I'm pouring in. You're not seeing that with the L coaster. And you're also not seeing the letter slowly disappear like you are in the other three because the letter keeps 
floating up to the surface. And no matter how many times I push it down, it's gonna keep floating up. And that's also going to mess up how the colors are interacting around it. Because as I push that letter down over and over again, it's going to start mixing the colors around it. And that became a problem. Once I got all four colors in each of the coasters, I went back in with all the colors that I had used before, just so that I could get even more layers of color and make it really interesting. The end product of these coasters ended up having kind of a tie-dye effect, which was super cool. And I remade this L coaster again after this, of course, and it looked exactly like the other three. If you didn't see this video as proof, you might never know that that fourth coaster wasn't made at the same time as the other three. Uh, so if you're if you're watching this, my friend who commissioned me to make it, um, sorry, art be crazy. <laughs> I unfortunately sent these out as soon as I pulled the fourth one from the coaster, so I didn't get to get any footage of them all together. But they were really beautiful and I really wanna make something else with this type of tie-dye style in a mold in the future. Let's move on to the next project where I'll be pressing flowers and pigment into resin. And this is an example of a coaster that I made using the techniques that you're about to see. Once I have all of my protective equipment on, I am ready to pour my resin and my hardener. And I'm including the mixing step again, even though I know you've already seen it with the last project. But I just cannot express how important it is that you mix your resin really, really well. It's not a very forgiving medium if you don't get it right in the beginning. I have some beautiful gold powder that I'm going to mix into some resin. I don't need all of it to be gold. This is a lot of resin in this pour cup. So I'm gonna measure out a little bit into a plastic cup and mix about a spoonful of the gold pigment in. This gold resin is going to go into most of the molds that you see to the left here, but I'm just gonna focus on these hexagonal coasters for the most part in this project video. Using the same stick that I was stirring the resin with, I am going to be using it just to drape some lines of gold resin into it. And I'm going around the perimeter of the coaster, the outside edge. I'm trying to avoid putting too much pigment into the middle of the coaster. And that's because I'm eventually going to be putting some flowers down there. And if I have a lot of gold pigment down and then I lay the flowers down on top, that gold is going to cover up a lot of the flower because it is so pigmented and opaque. So you won't be able to see much past the gold. Just like with the first project, I'm going to be adding a layer of clear resin into the mix here. This is gonna give me a first layer that is nice and clear and clean. The flowers can stick to it and show up really nicely. And there will be a little bit of gold interacting with all of it. That'll be really beautiful. And then once that cures completely, I can add another layer of color behind all the flowers. To the left, you can see an example of a coaster that has already had its first layer, but needs its second layer. The coaster that I'm handling right now isn't going to get any gold in it at all. This is just an extra mold that I decided to try out some new techniques in. So I am going to be adding some clear resin, and then on top of that, I sprinkled some magic blue powder. Magic blue is a pigment that looks white, but shines blue. And so I wanted to take a little bit of it and just mix it as nicely as I could with a stirring stick onto that surface of the clear, leaving the middle still clear, but a nice cloudy ring of magic blue haze around where the flowers will be. 
take notice on how I'm pushing these flowers into my resin. I'm not pushing them all the way down till they hit the mold bottom. I want them to be suspended in between a layer of clear or lightly pigmented resin and then a layer of colored resin that I add in later. I want it to be between those layers so that it's protected. It doesn't create any air pockets that might make it cure improperly. And it's just going to look a little bit more aesthetically pleasing. I'm gonna move on to the commission work here, which were two hexagon coasters that have gold, pressed flowers, and some pink pigment. So, I am making three here because I figured if I mess one up, then I can replace it quickly. Whoopsies. If you see a little bit of plant matter that gets away from the rest or you don't like as much, just fish it right out. It's no problem. Resin isn't a fragile medium, especially during the 40 minute work time window. If you make a mistake during it, you can quickly correct it and it will be totally fine. Afterwards though, it becomes more difficult to fix mistakes or work with the resin at all. One time I accidentally cured one of my dog's hairs into a piece and I didn't realize it or discover it at all until it was too late and it was the worst. And just to make sure these coasters are nice and spicy, I am adding some magic pink pigment powder to them. And much like magic blue, this is a white powder that shines pink. Really lovely, nice baby pink. And I'm mixing that in all around the perimeter of my coaster's clear edge. And this is going to be really nice because it's going to add some really cool texture to the coaster, but some of this pink pigment is going to sink down and touch the gold pigment and those two colors playing in the clear resin is really really special and pretty. Something cool about resin is that it's a self-leveling medium and that means that it wants to naturally create a nice flat smooth top surface. So it's going to want to fill all the nooks and crannies of the mold. It's going to be spreading and kind of reaching as it cures. And that means if you have pockets of pigment or if you swirl in some different colors like I'm doing here, they're going to be reaching and pushing and moving around during the curing process. I'm going to jump ahead a bit to show a second layer pour so that you can watch the full process of a coaster project. I'm adding some white resin mixed with a little magic purple. You can probably guess, but magic purple is white pigment powder that shines purple. I'm also going to sprinkle in some pigment into the middle, and then I'll swirl it around a little with a stirring stick. As this cures, that blue pigment is going to reach out to the outer edges of the mold while still dancing around with the lighter colored resin. I'm filling the mold the rest of the way up with clear resin. This is going to give the blue more movement to play around, but it's also going to add some translucence to the coaster so that you can show off all of its layers. The first layer of the clear resin has a little bit of pink swirled in, and it has some beautiful pressed flowers. And then on top of that, I believe there's some gold. So there's a lot going on on this coaster on the other side. And I'm gonna finish off these coasters by blasting each of them with the heat gun. And the heat gun is gonna pop all of the air bubbles in the surface and within the mold. They'll rise up to the top and the heat gun can pop them super easily. You can also use a blowtorch for this, but I don't love working with an open flame, so this is a safer option. And a heat gun can also be used to do some cool effects that you'll see in the next project. And here are two of the coasters all finished and cured. I especially love this blue one because I think that you can see the magic blue powder in that first layer. And then I just had some clear resin and some blue resin mixing in the back. You can see the colors reaching. So cool. 
I'm gonna cap this video off with the coolest project I've completed so far. I decided to repurpose one of my side tables just to see how I could do with resin pouring on furniture. Since this table has a lip all the way around it, I figured it would be perfect to pour resin into the middle of. So I want to create a primed surface for it and that's why I am painting it with some white acrylic paint. Acrylic paint and resin stick together so I wasn't worried about them not bonding together. I knew that they would interact well. And I wanted a nice white because I figured that the white would make the colors on top pop a little bit more. You just saw my paint cloth. If you're painting anything, I sincerely think that you should have a paint cloth. It's going to clean up your edges and if you make any mistakes, it will be right there to help you out with. And you can see, I make a few mistakes. I'm not going to pour the resin on this table right away. I actually wait overnight and the day after this video was filmed, I did my resin pour. And that's because I need to make sure that this is completely dry before I put any resin on it at all. Resin's number one enemy is water or moisture. Any sort of moisture is going to make it cure improperly. It's actually a bit hydrophobic resin. It cannot properly harden or work at all if you're working with something that is wet. So if you're working with molds or a canvas, anything at all, you have to make sure that they are completely dry. Now we're going to wait overnight and in the morning, we are ready to start pouring. So, hello, hi, are you ready? I am, let's get to work. So put your mask on everybody and we are going to start pouring. I have quite a few colors that I am putting onto this table. So I'm gonna show you a few. I have just a plain white. I have a magic blue powder. I also have this beautiful emerald green, a nice brown that has a blue color shift to it in the light. I have a really nice bright, vivid teal, and I have a nice rich cobalt blue. I'm just adding the white resin first. It'll be a base layer that all the fun colors can interact on top of it. So now I wanna add one of my star colors, this green, I love it so much. And my big plan going in was to have a nice prominent piece of green on that table. So I'm gonna use that thick diagonal line that you see here. I don't wanna put too much pigment on top of this thicker green slice. So you're gonna see how I do all of that now. I may put a little bit of color bordering up against that green or maybe a thin line of it down the middle later, but for the most part, I am just applying all the color to either side of it in zigzags. And it doesn't have to look really perfect at this stage because clearly it doesn't. It kind of looks like a hot mess, but I have to keep reminding myself and now you that a lot of this magical effects that you're gonna see in the finished table are from my heat gun. The more resin that you add though, the better it's gonna look because those colors are gonna start to finally meet each other and play a little bit. I saw this most with this chocolatey brown that I added, and I feel like it also gave so much more dimension to these colors, and it made me excited for the heat gun. Now a big part of the reason that you might wanna use a heat gun for your resin art is that it can pop all the bubbles that arise on the surface. We talked about that in the last project. But I also told you that a heat gun can give really cool effects to your resin art. And that's what you're seeing here. The colors are starting to push together from that hot air being blown on it. It's starting to blur the outer edges and really let those colors dance together. And it makes it look not like you just drizzled a bunch of colors on top of the tabletop, but almost as if those colors are naturally made to be next to each other and mixed together. 
It takes on the appearance and texture of marble or a geode. And that's a huge reason on why a lot of resin art that you may see looks like marble or looks like a geode. If you have a heat gun, that texture isn't that hard to recreate. And I'm not gonna say anything else. I think you should just enjoy the heat gun at work. It's very calming. Alrighty, I'm back and I am going to lay in more pigment. So I have this nice lavender and I don't want to add too much of it, but I do want a couple purple pops in this table. I think we have a lot of green and blue here, so it could give some cool contrast. I'm also going to be re-adding some of the colors that I already put into it. And that's because uh, with the heat gun doing its job, some of these colors kind of got lost in the sauce. Whoopsies, get those. Again, if you drop any resin, just like with paint, clean it up immediately if you can so that you don't ruin any of the exterior. I probably should have taped this down, but I didn't really think about it until just this very second while I sat here. I'm also going to be adding this beautiful copper gold pigment. I think that this is just a gorgeous, gorgeous color and it interacts really well with the other colors. It has a wonderful shine and so there's a little metallic edge to the table when I add this and it also complements the brown of the wood and the brown resin as well. So I want to add it in to just give more depth and more movement to the piece. And I'm so glad I did. It made a huge difference. Now there's a gap from the edge of parts of the table to where the resin begins. And it doesn't seem to wanna reach over and I don't really wanna tip the table to make it happen. So I'm pouring some resin into this empty bit and I'm also using my stirring stick to kind of blend it up to that edge. And once I add the heat gun to it, that won't be super noticeable, but it kind of is now. <laughs> And now that I filled those gaps, I'm gonna give a second round of heat gun action to ya. And you can see right here, I have a little bit of a powder burst. I did not mix some white and magic blue pigment very well because I kind of wanted there to be some powder bursts. They are really interesting as the resin spreads. However, you wanna make sure that that powder doesn't stay in a clump because it's going to add a little bump on the top. And I did put a layer of clear over top of all of this to smooth everything out. Uh, you can also sand it and then polish it again if you'd like. There are a lot of ways that you can create a flat surface. You just need to be careful in the curing process if you have some powder that isn't totally mixed. Make sure to clean all your edges up. See right here, that was a little bit of resin that I needed to catch quick. And now I'm going to give you another burst of heat gun action. Enjoy it. Now this is a little crazy, but I'm very carefully turning the table around now. My room is on a bit of a slant, it turns out, and I thought it was affecting how the resin was pushing towards me. So I turned it around to give it some time curing the other way. And I'm really glad that I did because this allowed the bottom right corner to do some amazing webbing effects where the color kind of spider webs across. You can see it happening a little bit with the copper already. 
Now I'm gonna add my heat gun again. I end up putting a little bit more resin into that bottom right corner. And again, I'm glad I end up doing that later because it just adds to the webbing. As mentioned before, after I finished making all of this, I let it cure for a full 24 hours and then I put a clear coat of resin on top of it. I didn't sand it down at all. And this is my final result. This is in my living room and I just want to do some nice close-ups of the color. Here's some amazing webbing. It's super, super shiny. You can see the reflection of my lamp super clearly, but if you look beyond that, you can see how these colors have interacted with each other, especially some of these metallics. And a lot of the whites are showing through, but the color on top of the whites is creating some amazing effects. Just get into it, my friends. I am really proud of it. I was a little curious about how successful I would be in making a piece of resin art on top of a piece of furniture. But I'm really glad that I tried because this is one heck of a statement piece in my living room. I don't think that this will be the last time I try to make a resin art furniture piece because I had a lot of fun. Okay. And that about does it. I hope that you've really enjoyed watching these videos. I've been really enjoying making them. And with resin art, I see a lot of potential to improve and get better. And I'm really excited to see where that takes me. And I hope you'll be along for the ride. So thanks. Bye.